Hey, greetings. This is day number 312. Today the Lord gives us deep insights as to what it's like to be led by him in this fallen world. Today we read Ezekiel 48, Isaiah 21, and 2 Corinthians 2. So let's turn to Ezekiel 48. In the chapters from Ezekiel yesterday, we heard more rules for the prince's worship and about the temple kitchens and a beginning part about the division of the land. Very fascinating in that is the part about the river that comes out from the east side of the temple, including trees that are for healing, bearing fruit every month. We will soon hear about this river and the trees of life in Revelation. Ezekiel 48 Heading The Division of the Land Among the Tribes The northern boundary of the land runs eastward from the Mediterranean Sea to the city of Hethlon, to Hamath Pass, to Anon City, to the boundary between the kingdoms of Damascus and Hamath, Each tribe is to receive one section of land extending from the eastern boundary west to the Mediterranean Sea, in the following order, from north to south. Dan, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Ephraim, Reuben, and Judah. Heading. The special section in the center of the land. The next section of land is to be set apart for special use. It is to be ten miles wide from north to south, and the same length from east to west as the sections given to the tribes. The temple will be located within this section. In the center of this section, a special area ten miles by eight miles is to be dedicated to the Lord. The priests are to have a portion of this holy area. From east to west, their portion is to measure ten miles, and from north to south, four miles. The temple of the Lord is to be located in the middle of this area. This holy area is to be for the priests who are descendants of Zadok. They served me faithfully and did not join the rest of the Israelites in doing wrong, as the other members of the tribe of Levi did. So they are to have a special area next to the area belonging to the Levites, and it will be the holiest of all. The Levites also are to have a special area south of that of the priests. It, too, is to be ten miles from east to west by four miles from north to south. The area dedicated to the Lord is the best part of all the land, and none of it may be sold or exchanged or transferred to anyone else. It is holy and belongs to the Lord. The part of the special area that is left, ten miles by two miles, is not holy, but is for the general use of the people. They may live there and use the land. The city is to be in the center of it, and it will be a square 2,520 yards on each side. All around the city, on each side, there will be an open space 140 yards across. The land that is left after the city has been built in the area immediately to the south of the holy area, four miles by two miles on the east and four miles by two miles on the west, is to be used as farmland for the people who live in the city. Anyone who lives in the city, no matter which tribe he comes from, may farm that land. And so the total area in the center of the section which was set apart will be a square measuring ten miles on each side, and it will include the area occupied by the city. To the east and to the west of this area, which contains the temple, the priest's land, the Levite's land, and the city, the remaining land belongs to the ruling prince. It reaches east to the eastern boundary and west to the Mediterranean Sea, and is bounded on the north by the section belonging to Judah, and on the south by the one belonging to Benjamin. Heading Land for the other tribes. South of this special section 
Each of the remaining tribes is to receive one section of land running from the eastern boundary west to the Mediterranean Sea, in the following order, from north to south. Benjamin, Simeon, Issachar, Zebulun, and Gad. On the south side of the portion given to the tribe of Gad, the boundary runs southwest from Tamar to the oasis of Kadesh, and then northwest along the Egyptian border to the Mediterranean Sea. The Sovereign Lord said, That is the way the land is to be divided into sections for the tribes of Israel to possess. Heading The Gates of Jerusalem There are twelve entrances to the city of Jerusalem. Each of the four walls measures 2,520 yards, and each wall has three gates, each named for one of the tribes. The gates in the north wall are named for Reuben, Judah, and Levi, those in the east wall for Joseph, Benjamin, and Dan, those in the south wall for Simeon, Issachar, and Zebulun, and those in the west wall are named for Gad, Asher, and Naphtali. The total length of the wall on all four sides of the city is 10,080 yards. The name of the city from now on will be, The Lord is Here. Now let's open to Isaiah 21. Yesterday's chapter in Isaiah was only six verses long. It always seems very unfair to me that Isaiah had to go about naked as a sign about two countries that were not even his own. Surely it was a sign for the people of Israel's benefit as well. I wonder if Isaiah's being, quote, naked was really what we call stark naked. In some cultures, if a man is wearing a loincloth, he is still called naked. Just as the description in Isaiah 20 states, a person wearing a loincloth will still have their buttocks exposed. Isaiah 21 A VISION OF THE FALL OF BABYLON Isaiah speaks. This is a message about Babylonia. Like a whirlwind sweeping across the desert, disaster will come from a terrifying land. I have seen a vision of cruel events, a vision of betrayal and destruction. Army of Elam, attack! Army of Media, lay siege to the cities! God will put an end to the suffering which Babylonia has caused. What I saw and heard in the vision has filled me with terror and pain, pain like that of a woman in labor. My head is spinning and I am trembling with fear. I had been longing for evening to come, but it has brought me nothing but terror. In the vision a banquet is ready. Rugs are spread for the guests to sit on. They are eating and drinking. Suddenly the command rings out, Officers, prepare your shields. Then the Lord said to me, Go and post a sentry and tell him to report what he sees. If he sees riders on horseback, two by two, and riders on donkeys and camels, he is to observe them carefully. The sentry calls out, Sir, I have been standing guard at my post day and night. Suddenly here they come, riders on horseback, two by two. The sentry gives the news, Babylon has fallen. All the idols they worshipped lie shattered on the ground. My people, Israel, you have been threshed like wheat. But now I have announced to you the good news that I have heard from the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel. Heading, A Message About Edom This is a message about Edom. Someone calls to me from Edom. 
Sentry, how soon will the night be over? Tell me how soon it will end. I answer, Morning is coming, but night will come again. If you want to ask again, come back and ask. Heading, A Message About Arabia This is a message about Arabia. People of Dedan, you whose caravans camp in the barren country of Arabia, give water to the thirsty people who come to you. You people of the land of Tema, give food to the refugees. People are fleeing to escape from swords that are ready to kill them, from bows that are ready to shoot, from all the dangers of war. Then the Lord said to me, In exactly one year the greatness of the tribes of Kedar will be at an end. The archers are the bravest warriors of Kedar, but few of them will be left. I, the Lord God of Israel, have spoken. Let's prepare to read 2 Corinthians 2 by turning to the last two verses of chapter 1. At the beginning of chapter 2, Paul is still telling about his change of plans and showing why he doesn't want to be misunderstood in his motives concerning that. I will read verse 23 in the NLT and verse 24 in the PET, Plain English Translation. Verse 23. Now I call upon God as my witness that I am telling the truth. The reason I didn't return to Corinth was to spare you from a severe rebuke. Verse 24. My purpose, and that of the other apostles of Christ, isn't to command how each of you in the Corinthian church live out your beliefs. We are certain that each of you will keep standing firm in your belief. We just want to work with you so that your joy keeps on increasing because of living according to your beliefs. 2 Corinthians 2 so I made up my mind not to come to you again to make you sad. For if I were to make you sad, who would be left to cheer me up? Only the very persons I had made sad. That is why I wrote that letter to you. I didn't want to come to you and be made sad by the very people who should make me glad. For I am convinced that when I am happy, then all of you are happy too. I wrote you with a greatly troubled and distressed heart and with many tears. My purpose was not to make you sad, but to make you realize how much I love all of you. Now if anyone has made somebody sad, he has not done it to me but to all of you, in part at least. I say this because I don't want to be too hard on him. It is enough that this person has been punished in this way by most of you. Now, however, you should forgive him and encourage him in order to keep him from becoming so sad as to give up completely. And so I beg you to let him know that you really do love him. I wrote you that letter because I wanted to find out how well you had stood the test and whether you are always ready to obey my instructions. When you forgive people for what they have done, I forgive them too. For when I forgive, if indeed I need to forgive anything, I do it in Christ's presence because of you in order to keep Satan from getting the upper hand over us, for we know what his plans are. When I arrived in Troas to preach the good news about Christ, I found that the Lord had opened the way for the work there. But I was deeply worried, because I could not find our brother Titus, so I said goodbye to the people there and went on to Macedonia. But... Thanks be to God, 
For in union with Christ, we are always led by God as prisoners in Christ's victory procession. God uses us to make the knowledge about Christ spread everywhere like a sweet fragrance. For we are like a sweet-smelling incense offered by Christ to God, which spreads among those who are being saved and those who are being lost. For those who are being lost, it is a deadly stench that kills. But for those who are being saved, it's a fragrance that brings life. Who then is capable for such a task? We are not like so many others who handle God's message as if it were cheap merchandise. But because God has sent us, we speak with sincerity in His presence as servants of Christ. Please pray together with me. Dear Lord Jesus, How far our churches fall short of the guidelines and examples given in the New Testament. Most churches today never put a member under discipline, and those that do seldom ever reach the stage where love is shown to the disciplined member so that he or she is restored to fellowship in that body. Help us, Lord Jesus, because Satan so often defeats us, and we too often fail to block his plans. Lord, give discernment to my listener if he or she is attending a church that treats God's message as cheap merchandise. Paul's testimony informs us that our best and most reasonable explanation of the good news about Christ will still be a revolting stench in the nostrils of people in whom you are not already working in their hearts. Help us to teach the gospel like Paul did so that our words are sweet to those in whom you are working, but will still stink to those in whom you are not working. Like Paul, we cry out, We're not capable for such a task. And that's why we ask for your Spirit to enable us today.